This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Join us each week for Everyday Tech on MPB Think Radio. We have an IT expert, a computer repair ace, and we troubleshoot your problems on the phones as well. Everyday Tech, Wednesdays at 10 on MPB Think Radio. Download the podcast now or listen on YouTube on the MPB Think Radio channel. Welcome to In Legal Terms from MPB Think Radio. It's the show all about you and your rights. Our host is Professor Richard Gershon of the University of Mississippi School of Law. I'm Liz Gill. Hello, Professor Gershon. Good morning, Liz. How are you? I, uh, I know uh, that, uh, I, don't, I don't know if you want the listeners to know this, I may be violating some kind of HIPAA law or something like that, but you're not feeling 100%. No, I'm, I, we're doing this via Zoom with modern technology because I'm home because of COVID. Uh, you can try to be as vigilant as you can for three years and then it'll still bite you. Well, we're glad you're here and hope you feel okay and uh, everybody's rooting for you, but uh, thanks, thanks for joining us this morning, but we're also excited to have my wonderful colleagues, uh, Professor Molly Ferguson and Professor Will Wilkins, and uh, it's a pleasure to welcome them both to the show. And uh, we'll be talking about copyrights and trademarks today, but uh, they both bring a lot to the table. So I'm going to let them talk a little bit about, for example, Molly, would you talk a little bit about the other things you're doing, like uh, co-director of the Business Law Institute? Sure, sure. So, um, hi, Richard. Uh, my practice generally has been transactional, involves uh, drafting and reviewing contracts, including licensing, copyrights, and trademarks. But I've been at the law school since 2001. Um, I'm currently co-director of the Business Law Institute. And so under that umbrella, we have our negotiation board, which is fabulous with law students. We win awards all over the country um, in competitions. And we also have the Business Law Fellows, which is a really program where we have um, first-year law students compete, and then we place them with different in-house lawyers and and companies around, um, around the area, and they get to see what in-house counsel do and and what business lawyers do and so that's really a unique opportunity and so we oversee that here and that's that's really fantastic well thank you for being here and and also will wilkins um you are a director of the mississippi law research institute and and i know you do some work with the general counsel's office yeah sure i hi i'm will wilkins and i um teach at the law school i teach copyright class and i teach another ip class or two from time to time um, I am also the director of Mississippi Law Research Institute, where I've been here since 2000. Mississippi Law Research Institute um, really works with the public sector as an outreach body of the law school, and we work with the public sector um, and do all kinds of legal research and things with the, the focus is to help improve Mississippi laws and to help people that are doing that and whose goal is to do that. The work that we do, it's broad. The work I do is fairly narrow because I really focus on intellectual property work, um, particularly in the area of copyright trademarks. Um, and, and like Molly, my background is as a transactional attorney um, and did, did a lot of transactional work, a little bit of litigation, but mostly transactional work. And you know, you have one of your clients is the Office of General Counsel here. and so. As much as we'd love to know the ins and outs of everything that goes on at the university, um, you're really not allowed to talk about that work, are you? Yeah, so, so one of the facets of what we do is we provide intellectual property research and information to the universities in Mississippi, the public universities in Mississippi. Um, I am not an attorney for the universities. I'm do not the universities, but I do, I do work with them there. Um, so any questions like that um, about the universities or, or would certainly be better answered by somebody more qualified to answer them than I, which would be somebody in the general counsel's office. All right. Thank you. So um, we won't ask those questions. I won't ask those questions. I, and I hope uh, the listeners will, will hear that as well. Um, so now um, if we could turn to just some basics and why don't we start with copyrights and uh, what, what exactly is a copyright? I mean, people hear that term um, and what is it? What does it protect? Well, the, the good news is, is that copyright law has been simplified in some ways over the last few years um, in the United States. Copyright protects, and this is just the, the kind of standard statutory definition, copyright protects original works of authorship, which have been fixed in a tangible medium of expression. I'll explain those a little bit. Um, it protects original works of authorship, which have been fixed in a tangible medium of expression. So the work has to be original, and we'll take a book for an example. Um, the, the work or the book that's protected by copyright law has to be original, which means it has to have some level of creativity. That level is fairly low. 
Um, but it also has to be independently created by the person that wrote it. In other words, he didn't take it from someone somewhere else. So it's got to be original. It's got to be a work of authorship. The statute lists eight different types of works, and I think we'll get into those later. Um, books certainly would fit squarely into that category, those categories of works. And then it has to be fixed in a tangible medium of expression. And that means that it's got to be somewhere other than in my head. It has to be, be expressed somewhere. Um, I, the, the, y'all would probably be better off if I were reading from a script right now, but I'm not. I have some notes in front of me. Um, they're not very good notes. Uh, and so what I'm doing right now, were it not being recorded and some of those things, um, it would not be fixed in a tangible medium of expression. So extemporaneous speech like this, if it's not recorded, uh, is, is not fixed in a tangible medium of expression. So for copyright protection now in the United States, our original a work of authorship and fixed and tangible media expression. So if I write a book and there's some level of creativity to it, the moment it's written, it's protected by copyright law in the United States. There used to be some formalities in the United States that, that from time to time had some uh, more relevance than they do now. Really, when the United States joined the Berne Convention, we began doing away with a lot of those formalities. And some of them you may have heard of is our publication. Public works used to not be protected by federal law until they were published. Um, and publication was a bit of a term of art, but works weren't protected by federal law. There was kind of a dual system of federal state law that doesn't exist more because the work doesn't have to be published to be protected. Um, you've all seen copyright notices at the bottom of web pages. Probably if you go to Mississippi Public Radio's uh, web page at the bottom is going to be a copyright notice that says copyright or the little C with the circle around it. Um, and it'll say the name of the owner, which would be must be public radio, and then give a date. That's a typical copyright notice. Works used to be protected when they were published with notice. If they were published without notice in the past, then they would go into the public domain um, with some of them. You could cure that in some instances. But notice isn't required anymore. But I will say that the, the um, notice is free. Um, and notice is very simple. You can put it at the bottom of anything you create, and you can be wrong about the fact that it's protected by copyright law. Well, there's no penalty for that. Notice serves some great purposes. It tells people when something was created, um, but it also tells them how to get in touch with you if they want to use your work and, and think that it doesn't fit into fair use or something. So notice is hugely helpful, and I, I, I think everyone should use copyright notice when they can. Another formality is registration. Registration um, is not required for protection. Registration, and, and we'll get into the nuts and bolts of registration after a bit, I think. But the registration is, is fairly simple. It's a short form, and it provides some real opportunities, some real, real um, advantages. For one thing, you can't file a lawsuit in federal court until you have a complete registration. We used to think that you could um, file a lawsuit and the next day file, I mean, file a registration and the next day file a lawsuit. The Supreme Court has clarified that in the last few years. You actually have to have that registration federal lawsuit. So registration is necessary for that, but it also gives you some legal advantages that we lawyers like, like more opportunity to recover attorney's fees and stuff like that. Um, one of the really unique things and the reason that I get excited about copyright law is that copyright law provides a monopoly for the owner, for the owner, the, the, the person that's created the work and owns the work. They have a limited monopoly, which means they have the right to control that work and control the uses of that work. But the cool thing about copyright law that's so different than other areas is that the statutes also give people that don't own a copyrighted work some limited opportunities to use the work without the owner's permission. And we're going to get into those later, I think. But that makes it, that's a really, it's really strange in the world of property law. That if you own a piece of land um, where well, you get to use it from nine to uh, seven in the morning, from nine at night to seven in the morning, but then other people can come use it other times. We know that's not the, that's not the, the law in real property, um, but in copyright, it is the law. There are times that other people can use your work without your permission. That's, to me, really exciting. That really creates this kind of vibrant um, area of law. There are, one thing also to clarify just at the beginning is to the distinction between ownership of the physical work and of the copyright. When I go to Square Books here in Oxford and I buy a book, um, by by uh, any author, but I think of a famous author. When I buy, I have some rights to that book. I have the right to resell that book. I have the right to read it or not read it or do really what I want to with it. But I don't have the right, any copyright rights in that book. Um, and that makes sense to everybody, right? So I buy a book. I don't have the movie rights because I spent $24 at, at, at the bookstore. 
Um, and so ownership of the physical work is very different from ownership of the copyright. And that, that I think that makes sense to everybody when we talk about books, but it, when we get into things like photographs, that begins to get a little cloudier in some people's minds, but the rules are still the same. Just because I buy the physical object does not mean I have any copyrights. So that's copyright in a nutshell, and we can come back and talk about specifics however you like. I love it that our uh, guest, Will Wilkins, is excited about copyright law. I love copyright law. <laughs> You can email us your questions to our address, legalterms at mpbonline.org. We are talking about copyright and trademarks this morning with our guests, Molly Ferguson and Will Wilkins, both attorneys and professors at the University of Mississippi School of Law. We've been talking about copyrights and we'll move a little bit into trademarks now. Well, um... And so let, let's let's turn to Molly, uh, you know, and ask about trademark because uh, Will did a great job, you know, setting up what what copyrights are. So, what exactly are trademarks? So, trademarks are essentially a source identifier. Um, a trademark really can be almost anything. Um, it can be a word, a phrase, a symbol, a design. It can even be a color or a scent or a sound. Um, a trade, literally, it can be almost anything that indicates the source of your good or your service, um, a slogan or any kind of combination of those things. And so what you're trying to do is you're just identifying your good or service. And it's really, again, a, a business source identifier so that you can separate yourself in the market um, from your competitors. And so, whereas a lot of times copyright is, you know, protecting your expression of your artistic work, trademark is more of a commerce type thing. And so it's more business owners and, and things like that will trademark, you know, what they have created to represent their good or service. And, well, and, and so it seems to me it's almost that while the trademark protects that brand, it really protects consumers too. Because if I'm driving down the, down the road, and I want just clean bathrooms. I'm looking for maybe something familiar, like I hope it's okay that I mentioned this company. And you know, and they've got their their golden arches, right? I mean, they are identifiable. So if I'm driving down the road and some other people say, "Well, we're going to put up some golden arches too," um, I might be confused about that. It seems like so. It, does it protect me too? Absolutely, absolutely, and that's and that's kind of what it's out there for is to protect the likelihood of confusion and to and for consumer protection. So you know that when you see those golden arches, that you are going to that place for whom that trademark represents that good and service. Um, now, one thing you know that you can register a trademark; it just represents that specific good and service. So now it's not saying that you can prevent someone else from using that mark in regard to something else, right? So you could possibly put now, probably not the golden arches. That's not a great example because they've probably trademarked that on lots of things. Um, but if you have a mark, say for example, lampshades and someone else uses that same mark for um, tissues, it might, you know, they might be two different things, but in your particular good or service, that is what it's meant to represent and the likelihood of confusion on that. Yeah, so how, how I mean, is it involved? Uh, Will was talking about copyrights or to create, really. I mean, you know, if you just, you know, put, you know, copyright uh, on, on the material, uh, just the fact it's original. Um, but what about a uh, trademark? Do you have to go through a process to trademark something? Well, yes and no. I mean, similar to copyright, you become a trademark owner as soon as you start using your trademark with your good or service. Um, you establish your rights in your trademark by using it, but those rights are limited and you um, they only apply to the geographic area in which you are providing your good or service. So you're not required to register your trademark, but by registering it, you're provided broader rights and protections than an unregistered trademark. Um, what's different about trademarks, copyright is purely in the purview of federal law. Um, and so, and that's given by the constitution, of course, you're in your article three, section two, you, you mentioned copyrights, but it leaves out trademarks. And so in trademarks, you've got 
concurrent jurisdiction with federal and state. And a lot of states have their own trademark legislation. In fact, Mississippi has great trademark legislation. And you can register trademarks in your state. If you don't think you're going to go outside of the state, you can just register within your state. You can register in multiple states. Um, but you can also register on the federal register. And that gives you pr broad protection you know, across. And now where everyone's on the internet and all that kind of stuff, that's probably, you know, um, a better idea. You know, I, well, I shouldn't say for everybody, their situation is different, but you don't have to register. And that's where the symbols come in, right? So if you have a service um, for service mark after it, and that tells somebody, look, I'm claiming this as my mark or the TM, I'm claiming this as my mark. Um, once it's actually registered on the federal register, that's when you get to use that R in the, in the circle to show that it's actually registered. So registration isn't required, um, but it's recommended. It gives you more protections. And it's again, a notice saying, look, I'm claiming this as my mark in association with this good or service. Now, we know that our Mississippians are very creative. We've done this show before, and we're having it again. So this is your chance to call in and ask attorneys what the laws are about copyrights and trademarks. And that email address is legalterms at mpbonline.org. Well, I think, you know, that sometimes people get confused and, and don't know whether we're talking about copyright or trademark. So let's say I write a, a book, a, a fan fiction, you know, that's a big thing now, on, on, you know, where people take um, uh, characters from Star Trek and they create their own fiction using those Star Trek characters. Um, if I was violating anything, would it be copyright using Captain Kirk and Spock, for example, or Picard or whoever the Star Trek character is? Or would it be a trademark violation if I, if I was to get in trouble or if, if, in fan fiction? I mean, are they, how do we know which it is? Um, I'm, glad to, I'm glad to take a stab at that, to, to kind of take a step back from your question, because your question is a, that's a kind of cutting edge, a leading edge question in both areas of the law. Uh, but, but Molly was right when, you, when she's talking about the kind of philosophical underpinnings of trademark and copyright. They're very different. Copyright is there, at least um, pursuant to the Constitution, to encourage the creation of these works. Trademark is, is more of a business to businesses and to protect consumers. Um, there's overlap in uh, what's protected, uh, maybe not in the philosophy, but in what's protected. So if I design a great, uh, uh, if I create a great design and I use that design with a product that I market, um, and you can just think of hundreds of examples, uh, copyright, if it's original work of authorship, which it would be if it's a design, a graphic design, um, and so if it's original and fixed and tangible medium of expression, copyright law protects that. But also, um, uh, trademark law would protect that if you use it in commerce with a good or service. Um, and so, so it's not that there's necessarily overlap in the law, but both areas of law would protect that. Um, and, and I teach copyright law, and a lot of times I have to remind students when we're looking at cases that we're only looking at the copyright aspect of this, but there's probably other aspects of the case that would involve trademark infringement, um, unfair competition, other, other things like that. So there is some overlap in that. So with your example with fan fiction, um, it, it's a difficult question. You'd have to look specifically at those characters um, and whether or not there's an established trademark in those characters, which is a pretty cutting edge uh, area. Fan fiction itself is, is a pretty, um, it, it's one of those areas that we like to talk about in copyright law because it's pushing all, everything that we have established in copyright law, fan fiction pushes it, particularly in the fair use area, which hopefully we'll talk about fair use later. So my answer in that is it's a, it very clearly depends. Um, and I'll let Molly clean that up. <laughs> no, no I, I like the it depends answer, Will. Yeah. That's, my, that's my standard refrain. <laughs> yeah. So I answered another question and then came back and didn't answer yours, Richard. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, I, well, I don't know that there is an answer. And I think that's part of what ha is happening in this area because... It used to be, I, I mean, copyright to me was always, it was printed material or recorded material, but there's so many different ways people express themselves now. So, you know, um, so let, let's talk about, I mean, is, it, 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 does copyright protect someone's Twitter post, for example? 
Yeah, so so with anything, particularly in a new area, like a Twitter post, which I guess is not particularly a new area anymore, but, but with any new area, we ask the same questions. Is it original? Does it fit within the scope of works of authorship? Um, and is it fixed in a tangible medium expression? So the statute defines, the copyright statute defines kind of eight areas of work, seven, depending on how you think of it, that are protected by copyright law. And that includes literary works, musical works, um, the recordings of those musical works, dramatic works, pantomimes and choreographic works, pictorial, graphical, and sculptural works. So Twitter post, um, depending on what the post is, if it's original, um, it's fixed image, tangible medium expression, it might fall under the literary works uh, definition, which is very broad. It includes things like books, things that we do all the time, writing articles, computer programs. It's a very broad category. So again, the answer is it depends on what's in the Twitter post as to whether copyright law would, would protect it. There's been um, some interesting cases recently with, with uh, that's really a fair use question, but uh, with artists taking other people's Twitter posts and using those in their artwork. Um, and and th there have been some copyright suits filed on that. Uh, and, and the defense is usually fair use, which we can get to later. Um, but yes, yeah, so a Twitter post is potentially protectable. And that being said, Twitter has terms of use and I've not read their terms of use, but their terms of use, I'm sure say something that when you post something on Twitter, you're, you're giving Twitter and maybe other users. And again, I'm speaking without having read those terms of use, but some rights to, to reuse those. Uh, but I'm not familiar with those and, and stand to be corrected on that probably. Professor yeah, I mean, Gershon, you're a big Twitter user. Have you read their terms of use? <laughs> you know, um, I was going to say, uh, yeah, you know, we should all read those terms of use before we do things, like <laughs> download stuff from, uh, you know, our our phone, uh, whatever, you know, mine is might have to be Apple, so Apple says we're doing an update, read the terms of use, and I just go, yeah, I agree. So I have no idea, even though I should have used it, but I think for me on Twitter, I want people to reuse my stuff, you know, retweet it or whatever. So, I mean, I, and I don't, I'm not saying anything of value. So it's not like I really have anything, you know, to protect. Um, but it's a good point. It's a great question. You know, I, I, it's not something that certainly 15 years ago, I think people gave much thought. And, and music is always one too. I know we're kind of breaking a bit, but we can come back maybe and talk a little bit about music. We'll talk more about trademark. But so here's a question to leave with. What about, uh, you hear songs that clearly sample some notes, some parts from other songs. And, and it, it, our song is copyrightable. And, and you know, can, how much of somebody else's song can you use before you cross that line? We would love for you to email us your questions. Our address is legalterms at mpbonline.org. We're talking with guests, attorneys, and Professor Molly Ferguson and Will Wilkins. And we're answering questions and talking about copyrights and trademarks. I'm Liz Gill. We do hope you'll subscribe to our podcast or you can find Think Radio recordings at mpbonline.org slash radio. Uh, thank you, Liz. And, and before the break, we, we asked a question, you know, sampling. I mean, you know, taking uh, parts of songs from other people and using them in your own quote, original song. And we, we've all heard songs that sound similar. Or, I mean, so where do we cross the line there? I mean, how does that happen? Well, to, to kind of begin in the beginning, uh, music is protected by particularly recorded music. There are two different, there's two different rights or two different uh, works that are protected. One is a song, which is a song composition, and the other is the musical recording. Um, and so both are protected by copyright law and may be owned by different people, um, it, depending on, on how the deal was done with the recording. Uh, but so you've got two different two different works in a music like that musical that's recorded. And then the owner of those rights has the rights to reproduce them. Those are what we would call the typical copyright rights, the rights to create derivative works, rights to distribute limited rights to distribute, the rights to publicly perform, and some other rights like that established by, by, the, uh, by the statutes. The flip side to that is if someone else reproduces, creates a derivative work, um, or, or performs those publicly, uh, they may technically be in violation of, of copyright law. Copyright law, however, provides a number of defenses or exceptions. Um, there's some great ones that I love, uh, like this classroom teaching exception that's very narrow and very specific, but it protects what the three of us do in the classroom. It says that we can use copyrighted works and without running afoul of it being violating somebody's public performance rights. Um, 
The other exception is fair use. And that's where I'm working on to sampling. With sampling, you, know, you are reproducing perhaps or creating a derivative work, depending on how you look at it. Someone's musical musical uh, uh, composition and recording as well, if you use the recording. Uh, but but it may also be fair use. And fair use is a, a uh, area that's been left uh, intentionally vague by both the, uh, the the statutes and somewhat by the courts. Um, it's a four-factor balancing test, which we lawyers love um, because it gives us, uh, you know, th this test that we can apply, but never really a great clear answer. And with the nature of work, in other words, the, the work that you're using, is it creative? If it's creative, we give it a lot of protection. If it's not as creative, we give it less protection. You look at the purpose and character of the use. So you look at how the person is using the work. Um, the, the, this can be whether it's commercial or non-commercial, that's not determinative, but it's just a factor. Uh, one of the main things we look at with that uh, part of the balancing test is whether it's what we call transformative. Are you taking the work and doing something different with it? And that's, that's a, pretty major, um, uh, a pretty major factor. In fact, Professor Lintain, who you've talked about, that's done the show before, used to teach a class just on transformativeness of works. And so that's a big deal. This third third factor is the amount of substantiality you use. How much did you use and, and what parts of it did you use? We get questions a lot of times of if I use 50 words or if I use 10 seconds, that's fair use, right? Well, you'll notice that that is one half of one of four factors. So that's an eighth of the test. So maybe is the answer if you use a small part. And then we let, lastly look at the effect on the market. Um, are you taking something basically the courts would think should be in the purview, um, taking a benefit that should be something that the owner of the copyright should get to? So as you can see, the fair use test in any in any case, um, it, it's hard to come up with a clear answer a lot of times. It's, it's a generally a jury question. So now we're going to go to the phones and go to Mobile, Alabama, and let Wes ask a question or a comment. Wes, welcome to In Legal Terms. Thank you, and thanks for taking my call. And I think you were talking around my question, and it's about uh, the use of copyrighted material in business. And what I mean by that is, for example, if you're like a paid trainer and you cite data out of someone's book or you use a concept an idea or something from someone's book, or maybe you cite data from an academic journal or uh, a quote or something from an academic journal in your presentation material. Is that, are you bordering on copyright infringement with something like that, or do you need to get permission for that kind of use, or just any thoughts you might have? Hi, Wes. Thank you. That, 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 thank you for that question. And that brings up something that we should talk about with copyright law, which is um, and, and that copyright law does not protect facts. Um, so the it's 72 in Oxford today. That's not protected by copyright law, even though I just said it. And even if I wrote it down, it was intangible form, not protected. It also doesn't protect ideas. Now, the, the, the rub there is it does protect original expressions of those facts or ideas. Um, and so the, as, as, as a lawyer um, with that question, my question and what I would need to see from you is specifically what you're using um, and, and are you using their expression of it? And is it really a fact or an idea? Facts and ideas aren't protectable by copyright law. Um, maybe protectable, you know, under unfair competition law or trade secret law, but in, in terms of copyright law, facts and ideas are not protected, but it's very, very situation specific. Um, and so anyone that's going to answer that, the, the specific question you ask would have to look and see specifically what you what you wanted to use and stuff like that. Let me touch on permission as well. Um, I talked about that copyright law gives uh, the, the public the right to use copyrighted works when it's fair use. But that doesn't preclude ever asking for permission. You can always ask for permission. Um, some of our, our most famous copyright cases began with the defendant in the cases asking for permission and not getting it. Uh, and, and so permission is always a, 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 you know, a valid way to go. So if, when, when in doubt, you can always ask for permission. So anyway, hope that it helps when, a little bit. When you say expression, pro, it, pro, expression is protected, does that mean the arrangement of words or what, what does that mean? It can mean, it can, yes, it can mean the arrangement of words. It, um, it can be there even sometimes when you can take only facts and arrange them in a creative way that the courts will say that's a compilation of facts that's done in a creative way that's protectable. 
but it's it's a pretty tight that, that's pretty technical um and and it can be if you look at any any work of authorship like a book there's going to be stuff in there that's protected by copyright law and stuff that's not protected by copyright law and you just have to really get down into kind of the nitty-gritty of it to to distinguish okay thank you very much you're welcome thanks will we're glad you've called in now let's stay on the phones and go to madison and talk with holly holly thanks for calling in to in legal terms today where we're talking about copyrights and trademarks what's your comment or question hi I'm from Meridian. Uh, do you have the, the right, Holly? <laughs> You're on, so let's go. <laughs> okay. Um, my question is about uh, artwork, paintings and drawings. Um, once that it leaves the artist, it can be sold or, or there can be lithograph prints or so forth. I want to know if the artist always maintains some sort of copyright uh, uh, ownership of reproduction. Thanks, Molly. I'll, I'll answer that. Um, with copyright, in order to transfer the copyright to a work, um, the, the statute says that we have to have a written document that transfers copyright. So if I walk into a gallery in Oxford and buy a painting, I buy that painting, but I did not buy the copyright to it. Um, in order to get the copyright, I would have to actually have a, a written assignment of that copyright. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't some things I can do with the work. Um, and, and those things can fall into fair use or one of the other things that we talked about. But in terms of just strict uh, uh, copyright protection, um, the, the copyright is not transfer with the physical object unless there's a written agreement that does that. Oh, that's great. And, and does an artist have to copyright each individual painting or is that just implied? Well, copyright protection, again, in the U.S. now attaches when it's fixed in a tangible medium of expression. So for works that are created now, um, and and the, 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 unfortunately, in copyright law, or fortunately, if you like, complications, but unfortunately, in copyright law, we don't go back and make a lot of retroactive. So for works created in the past, there were some steps you had to take to secure a copyright. Um, but, but for works that are created now, that work is secured when it's fixed in, fixed in tangible medium of expression if it's original and falls into the categories under the statute. And w when you say in the past... I, I know that many years ago, it was my understanding that you even had to put that little copyright emblem and sign it to have That's that correct. implied copyright. That's yeah. correct. And there, there's some great, if, you, if you've got works that were created years ago that you're looking at, there's some great charts online mm -hmm. that you can look and see when the work was created and what was required at that time for copyright protection. Our current law will still enforce those older rules. Um, and those change throughout time. You know, those change throughout the time. Even I, uh, I do, this is mostly what all I do, uh, but I, I, I'll have charts and tools like that that I use. If somebody says, "Well, this was created in 1954," um, I, I will pull up one of those charts to see what was required in 1954 wow. for copyright oh, okay. protection. Yep. Yep. Okay. But now, now you don't have to put the copyright on the actual painting. Uh, for works created in 2022, you do not. Uh, but okay. but it is hugely beneficial to do that. It is, but it yeah, doesn't have to it, be visible. Can it be on an invisible part of the painting? I mean, what's under a mat, for example? Well, it doesn't have to be there at all. Um, so oh. so it doesn't necessarily have to be visible. The the benefits to copyright to using a copyright notice is it puts people on notice. It tells people, hey, I'm claiming copyright in this, and if you you know you want to use it in a way that's not fair use or one of the other exceptions, um, you know, look me up. Um, so it gives them a way to find you, and so that it's, it's beneficial right, in those ways, and it gives us some legal. Yeah. Yep. Well, yep. and I'm, I'm I'm sorry, but the the notice is that something that you have to file? I missed a little part of the radio because I was driving in the car before I got home. So so notice is is something that you place on the work itself. Then mm -hmm. there is a possible you you can also file a registration with the copyright office, um, which is a fairly simple registration. Uh, the registration gives you some other huge advantages. It's not it's not a, it quite as advantageous as a trademark registration, but it gives you some advantages, which is you can, after you've done it, you can file suit in federal court. Um, so you, you have federal protection, but you can't sue for it until you file the registration. Oh, okay. But when yeah. you say notice, that notice just means putting it on the work itself. Yeah, notice is what you see at the bottom of web pages. It'll say copyright 2022 Molly Ferguson. Um, it, it's, it's, the notice is just that simple. Thanks, Holly. We appreciate you calling in. Hey, we can take your questions on our email address. That's legalterms at mpbonline.org. Our guests are attorneys, professor and professors Molly Ferguson and Will Wilkins. 
They're answering questions and talking about copyrights and trademarks. Thank you for being part of In Legal Terms. If you've missed any of our program, you can listen to the whole show from the MPB Think Radio YouTube channel. It's also available on the MPB Public Media app, as are all our local shows. I'm Liz Gill. Don't forget at 11 a.m. Central on Tuesdays, following our over-the-air broadcast, you can hear Southern Remedies, Relatively Speaking, with Dr. Susan Buttress on MPB Think Radio. Hang on, Bill and Diane, we wanted to hear a little bit from Molly. Yeah, so I just wanted to follow up. Um, Will had mentioned uh, the the fair use in copyrights, and it's a little bit different in trademark. There is fair use in trademark. It's not quite the same. Um, the fair use doctrine in trademark is consistent with the First Amendment, and it allows someone to use another's trademark either in its non descriptive sense to describe their own product or in a descriptive sense to describe the user's own trademark, right? Or to talk about the other person's trademark. That might have been more confusing than it needs to be. But essentially, you've got to be careful because you can use another party's trademark in a misleading way. And although that might not be infringement, it could be false advertising. So in that in that regard, you want to be a little bit careful about that. Um, and then also, Richard had asked a question earlier, had mentioned, how do you, you know, is it possible to abandon a trademark? If you register it, yes. And then also if you don't use it, because trademarks, you know, they are there for use in commerce. If you register it, you have to, on the federal register between years five and six, you have to um, file a declaration of continued use. Then again, between years nine and 10, another one, and then every 10 years after that. So you lose your trademark protection by not using your mark in commerce. Let's go to the phones real quick and speak with Bill in Ridgeland. Bill, what's your comment or question for in legal terms today? Yeah, I've got a real technical one. I'm an attorney, and um, the a city has adopted the International Fire Code as an ordinance and required requires property owners to comply with that ordinance. But when I try to get a copy of it from the city, they say it's copyrighted and they cannot provide me with a copy. And the only way I can get a copy is have to buy a copy from the International Fire Code publisher. Um, does when a city adopts uh, a publication as an ordinance, is that does that waive the copyright law? Bill, I'm afraid I don't know the answer um, to that. The the that, that is a little bit outside kind of the, the purview of copyright, and it would depend. I don't. I'm not familiar with the International Fire Code, who wrote it, or things like that. Um, it's a good question, but I do, honestly I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Well, I can't find an answer either through research, but it seems to me that if the city is going to require property owners to comply with a city ordinance, they should be required to provide a copy of that to the property owner without having to the property owner have to buy a copy of the the, the code in order to comply with the code so i yeah. can't find an answer to that i was hoping y'all would know an answer i i think billy i think i'm not a copyright person but I, your instinct sounds good to me i know the tax code you can't they can't just enforce tax law without you know giving you the you know the, the, the information online so um or some other way for free. That seems to make sense. It, it's like the Mississippi Code uh, contains all statutes in Mississippi. And uh, if, if a person wanted to have knowledge of what's in the statutory law in Mississippi, they could look it up online um, without having to buy the Mississippi Code. So it seems like that would be analogous. Sorry, Bill, you, you stumped us on that one. Um, I hope, uh, good, good, good luck with that. Let's stay on the phones and take our last call and go to Diane, who's also in Ridgeland. Diane, what's your comment or question for our guests today? Okay, so I'm hoping mine is a whole lot easier and can be answered. <laughs> um, and so you may have already covered this, but I was on before, but I had to hang up. But so if you have an idea, uh, how can you go by protecting it in writing and present it to a company? Because I don't have the necessary equipment or all to make a prototype or anything like that. I want to be able to present the idea and still protect it and, you know, reap the benefits from that as well. So if I can get an answer for that. Diane, that may require both uh, Molly and 
to answer. <laughs> uh, the, the copyright protects original works, right? Um, it typically doesn't protect ideas, but there is protection for ideas in other other areas of the law. Um, and I think it would be good for an attorney to look at what you have and decide whether it's an idea or an expression or idea or whether it's patentable um, and those kind of things. And Molly has done a lot of transactional work and probably can address kind of generically how you go about that, um, at least in terms of contract, in terms of, terms of protecting an idea contractually. And yes, you would probably want to consult an attorney on that just to see what your idea is about, because it really does require knowing what the specifics are. In, in one regard, you could have a, a, um, a non-disclosure agreement in which you just then say, I want to talk to you about my idea as long as you don't disclose that idea. Some people are not willing to sign that without knowing what it has been about, that kind of thing. So there are different agreements that you could have when you meet with people to talk about it. Um, but without knowing more, it's hard to say. If it is a certain good or service, again, you could use um, to get some preliminary protection on that. Um, trademark protection. So there, there are different things you could do, but without knowing more, it's really hard to say on that. Diane, thank you so much for, for calling in. Um, I'll let Molly and Will also know, I try to put up a lot of sh information on our notes for the show. So if you can give me any uh, links, websites, or places where our listeners who couldn't call in, who might not be able to uh, have had a question answered where they can find information on their own um, that that might be available for them to look at later after the show. Happy to. Yeah. We are so glad that you were able to join us. We've had Molly and Will Wilkins as our guests. They're both uh, attorneys and also both professors at the University of Mississippi School of Law. We understand you're both busy people and we appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. Thank you. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you so much to our call screener, who is our intern, Charles Arnold. And thank you to our engineer, Jay White. For Professor Richard Gershon, who hosts at the University of Mississippi School of Law, I'm Liz Gill. We do hope that you'll join us next Tuesday at 10 a.m. Central or in legal terms on MPB Think Radio. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone.